Welcome one, welcome all. Thank you for tuning in to Cedar Lee Radio, your guide to films playing at the Art House for the week of August 9th to August 15th. My name is Aaron Spears. And I'm Dave Huffman. On this week's episode, we'll be discussing Maiden, Brian Banks, and Them That Follow. We'll also be discussing the career of D.A. Pennebaker, and two non-sports fans are going to be discussing our Cedar Lee 3 picks for best sports documentaries. Well, we always like to start off the show with the last scene first. So, Dave, what's the last film that you've seen? The last movie I saw was a film that actually played at the film festival this year that I sadly missed because ah. it was one of the ones I really wanted to see, and it was uh, One Cut of the Dead. Oh, the, nice. Uh, I believe I'm going to butcher the director's name. Good luck. I'm going to say uh, Shinichiro Ueda, uh, I think is how you would, at least that's how my American tongue is going to say it. Yeah, name. yeah. And it is uh, an extremely entertaining uh It's not a horror film. It is about zombies, loosely, (laughs) but it is really just a very clever movie, I would say, about filmmaking. It's kind of a comedy about filmmaking is what it really is, and it's extremely entertaining. It does have a distributor now, so we're looking to probably bring it back and play it for a show or two in October, so hopefully people have a chance to see it over at either the Cedar Lee or the Capitol but uh, I finally got caught up with it, and I, I think you did see it. At the I did, yeah, yeah. Didn't you? I stayed yeah, for like a I, midnight I, show after working that day, and it's I, normally that would have been exhausting, but it was so exhilarating in that theater because like everybody was clearly yeah. just they were all really there for it, it, they were ready for it, and they were all yeah. on board with it. Yeah, it is just a super fun movie, and it is kind of one of those movies like the less you know about it, the better. Uh, maybe me, my little uh, you know description of it might already give it away more than we should. So I would I just say. Think so. Well, go I don't think you gave it. away more than what was at least in the in the description yeah. for the festival catalog either. All right. Yeah. Well, there you go. So. so yeah, just go see it, and that's all you need to know. <laughs> it's really, really entertaining, and if you're a, a person who enjoys movies in general, you will enjoy this movie. I would yeah. say. Just if you enjoy clever filmmaking, uh, it's there's yes. a, there's a bunch of surprises it's, in there for you that will uh, just have you smiling. Yeah, it is absolutely one of the smartest, most clever uh, films I've seen in a really long time. I very much enjoyed it. Well, so separate, separate from the plot, though, because um, again, like it's really a fun movie to discover, and I'm guessing no one has heard of that movie. <laughs> there's not a lot of like, I mean, maybe the, locally there was some buzz during the festival, but it's pretty easy right. to go into that movie completely cold, but. Uh, mm-hmm. I know you said you had a lot of friends, including or including me, saying like, "Oh my God, Dave, you got to see it." Did that? Um, yeah, that didn't diminish the the uh, the impact of the film once you saw it. Not at all. all right. No, I think it it totally delivered. Cool. I had been wanting to see it. I think I had a friend that saw it either at Fantasia or Fantastic Fest. I can't remember which one they saw it at, and she had been raving about it ever since then. It was one of her favorite things she saw there, and then I finally got to see it. So it lives up. Excited to. It does absolutely all live right. up to it. And what was the last thing you saw? Uh, I caught up with. Um, Oh, actually, it is from this year. I didn't realize that. It's from 2019, Never Going Back. Uh, G O I N apostrophe. It uh, stars uh, Maya Mitchell and Camilla Marone, two up and coming mm-hmm. actresses. Um, it's Augustine Frizzell as the director. It's her directorial debut as a feature. She's done some shorts, and most recently, she did some, I think, at least one episode of Euphoria on HBO. Which mm. makes perfect sense if you know that show, because Never Going Back is two uh, high school dropouts, two, uh, two girls, their best friends, living right. with her brother in uh, the same room. They're sharing a two-bedroom apartment with him, and they decide one friend for the uh, for the other friend's birthday gets her a trip to Galveston. Uh, I think it's all set in Texas, so they're just going to go hang out on the beach for uh, a few days. But it's this perfect like working class comedy where they're both both characters work at a local just kind of like crappy diner. You know, restaurant, they're just getting by. They've forked over their rent for next month to pay for the trip to get to the beach just to have an escape for a few days. And then they picked up like eight shifts in a week just to make sure they can still afford their rent. But of course, nothing goes according to plan. There's, you Mm -hmm. know, jail involved. It's, I would say it's a good double feature with Book Smart because Book Smart's a bit more of the uh, affluent, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, teenage girls that are best friends. And the chemistry between the two main girls is just, it's amazing. It's the same level as Book Smart where you're like, it, awesome. The way they perform, you would just assume that they are lifelong best friends. Cool. And this one has that same kind of, um, not quite like absurdist comedy, the way Booksmart has like the the doll scene and right. some other stuff, but it does have an amazing uh, drug sequence. Um, not as good as the <laughs> doll scene, but still pretty good. But it's right now streaming on Canopy. If you have a library card, um, you can watch cool. that for free on Canopy. Very cool. But uh, I would highly recommend that one. It's a laugh out loud, funny, just like great, I guess sort of situational comedy because it, it just sort of amps up each each scene just gets like they get deeper and deeper into you know shenanigans and uh hilarity awesome well yeah i haven't seen it i will check it out 
So your last scene, Dave, is a coming soon for everybody because that was uh, a screener, I'm guessing, you watched of that one cut above the dead. Yes, that was uh, a screener. So again, one of the perks of my job, I get to yeah. see stuff before So that is a... Yeah. Uh, Stay tuned uh, for yes. future last scene for the audience. And then my last scene is Never Going Back, available to stream right now in the comfort of your own home. And mine is a highly recommended whenever it comes out. You should make it your priority to see One Cut of the Dead. Uh, was it a priority for the crowd this weekend, Dave, getting out to see The Farewell? I know you're a, a big fan of the movie. It was, actually. Yeah, it did very well here at the Cedar Lee. And people love, love, love it. I think it'll be one of those films that's playing for quite a while here. Yeah. Because when you're standing in the lobby, uh, I went downstairs yesterday afternoon just as one of the shows was getting out. And everybody just kind of took three steps out of the theater and then just stopped. And they were all just talking to each other about it. And you could tell that people were really loving the movie so it was great to see that uh the film got the response that it deserves i think even just the general premise of we're not telling grandma that she's dying of cancer but still throwing like the pretend weddings everybody can kind of say their goodbyes like that's going to spur some uh conversation yeah uh amongst the audience i caught up with sort of trust uh previous uh since last week and uh i really Enjoyed that one. I would say it's definitely fits in that like Lynn Shelton is still operating in kind of like a mumblecore kind of mm-hmm. aesthetic, you know, kind of a, a low key story, but like really well told, really well acted. Mm-hmm. And the kind of way that they skewer the like the racist white supremacist subculture that's selling yeah. or trying to find artifacts in order to prove that the South won the war on the weirdest technicality you could you can yeah. imagine um, <laughs> is uh, is very well parodied in um, a mm-hmm. very smart way. And also is uh, several character actors that popped up was like I had to look him up because I was like, I oh, remember that guy, that guy's face. Where, right. where do I know him from? Um, oh, the guy that uh, yeah that plays the, the appraiser, the white supremacist. He's yeah he's Ed- uh, on uh, on on Veep, the guy. Who, oh right right who, who, yeah. They ultimately go to who I love him on Veep uh, as the the really like the worst most kind of foul mouthed senator I think yeah yeah uh, who he plays in the in that show. So yeah, it was nice to see him. He was very funny. And then uh, for art house news this week, um, it, it's. It's weird as, as, as uh, well, I mean, everybody's aging, but as you and I get older as uh, film geeks, Dave, more and more of like the the idols or the people that were producing and making films, like when we were coming of age and first getting into films, are uh, passing away because they're getting older mm-hmm. now. And I really hadn't thought about it in uh, probably a few years, but D.A. Pennebaker uh, just passed away in his, in his 90s. Yeah. Um, still making movies that um, yep. I don't know. I caught myself reading like three or four different obituary kind of articles reflecting on his career and realizing like what kind of an impact he had on me getting into documentaries uh, in the first place back in in uh, in film school. The guy was a former engineer at Yale, and what really grabbed my attention when we were when I was in film school was um, he coming from an engineering background, was building cameras, which we don't think about in this day and age of just pull out your cell phone and start filming or right. make a movie. Um, there weren't lightweight. 16 millimeter and definitely not 35 millimeter cameras in the 50s like he was doing documentary filmmaking that was observational he helped start that whole direct cinema movement and he was the guy physically building 16 millimeter sync sound cameras so that they could go out into the real world and document what was going on and uh Mm -hmm. as you were looking through his filmography you said uh the Depeche Mode uh films he did well, I kind of forgot about like all the music stuff. You know, he did right. like, Monterey Pop, which is certainly an iconic, you know, uh, music documentary. He d- did the Depeche Mode 101 documentary, which I did not remember at all that he had directed that. And then uh, I was lucky enough to meet him. I think it was like ten years ago. I think it was the, the whenever Kings of Pastry was out. Is whenever we had him as a guest at the Provincetown Film Festival when I worked there. And uh, he was an incredibly gracious, very sweet man. And uh, that's what I would have talked to him about. I was like, so tell me about Depeche Mode. Like, that just seems like a weird conversation I could have had with him. So now that's my big right, regret. Right. I talked to him about a lot of uh, a few other things, but I never even mentioned that because I forgot that he had done that um, until just today. And his last feature documentary, we actually showed over at the Capitol as part of the um, doc series a few years ago called Unlocking the Cage, which was a great film about... Um, the tr- these, these this lawyer that has been trying to get sort of um, legal protection and legal status for intelligent animals, you know, saying you know locking up uh, like chimpanzees and and some of these other animals that are highly intelligent. Uh, she's trying to get them basically some like human um, human level kind of legal right. protections or protections and uh, and almost did it. Like you know, like so far no no. Like the kind of, I think every judge that hears the case and hears the legal arguments, 
they all make sense and they kind of agree with them, but at the same time, they're all sort of afraid of the legal precedent. Right, right, right. Yeah, that they don't be that set, first one. And the ripple effect yeah. that would have. So it's very interesting. It's a really good film. I would highly recommend it. It's called Unlocking the Cage. So um, check that one Which out. speaks to his kind of, I think, talents when you're an observational documentarian like that where you can tell that mm-hmm. story, but going through his filmography, the big chunk of stuff you're going to notice is the the music work and the concert films that yeah. he, one article I read just said that he, he not only kind of helped invent the concert film, but he also reinvented it mm-hmm. several times throughout his career. Again, you go, you're working, yeah. you know, into your eighties and nineties. Yeah. It's good mm-hmm. that you're actually reinventing and re and, uh, um, recalibrating your approach to, uh, how you are making films. Yeah. Uh, oh, I guess we also should mention, don't look back probably is his most famous documentary, yes. the Dylan mm-hmm. one. Um, well, I don't know if you need to mention it. He is a very famous filmmaker. And if you're listening to a film podcast, you've probably at least heard the name mm-hmm. over the last, uh, you know, was that six decades of, of, the, of the man's career. But uh, we will be right back with the new films that are opening this week at the theater. The first film we are opening this week is the documentary Maiden by director Alex Holmes. This is the story of Tracy Edwards, a 24-year-old cook on charter boats who became the skipper of the first ever all-female crew to enter the white bread round the world race in 1989. For me, sailing was about freedom. It was freedom of everything. It was leaving everything behind. My father died when I was 10. My parents instilled in me a sense of determination. So when I heard about the Whitbread Round the World race, it was just something I had to do. Sailing at that time was very male-dominated. There were just no women anywhere in it. The Whitbread Round the World race at 33,000 miles is the longest and most challenging on Earth. I wanted to be part of this. I remember going to the skipper and he went, we're not going to be the only racing team in the world, but a girl. And that's when I made the decision to put an all-female crew into the race. I didn't want a real job. I wanted adventure. So this race is infamous in, uh, I don't what would you say, nautical circles, nautical communities. Yeah. Um, yes. I hadn't heard of before this documentary, <laughs> uh, but also like the white bread round the world race is kind of a cumbersome title to a race. It, uh, it was called that in 89 when Tracy Edwards was there as a skipper. Is it white bread or is it white bread? bread? Whitbread. My eyeballs were just adding an E in there. <laughs> Sorry. The Whitbread Round the World Race. It's actually named for uh, a company um, uh, in England, I believe. So it went through a few different changes over the years. Um, it was like uh, some, like the Volvo Group was involved at some point. Anyway, now it's called the Ocean Race. It's this crazy race that like comes around every three years. It takes a long time to race, too. It's over 39,000 mm-hmm. nautical miles. And that is a lot of that's it's a lot, a of, lot boat. of boating. And it's also like such a tiny crew. I want to say it's like an eight to 12 mm-hmm. person crew. There's an embedded media person on each crew that doesn't do any actual sailing or, or boating. Right. Um, and then uh, <laughs> just documents and sends uh, back communications and footage uh, via satellite link right. You know when they stop at different ports. But yeah, there's literally an every three year like around the world um boat boating race <laughs> and it, it, the the documentary plays like a thriller the way like man on wire did a few years ago where like you yeah. kind of if you know the story like you know the ending but like it's still like oh my god i cannot believe human beings are doing this yeah it is one of those things that i have like zero interest like to ever kind of push my physical being to the level that some of these people do like the you know like free solo things yeah. like that i will never find myself in those situations i will never be part of a crew trying to sail around the ocean uh, unless my life takes a real <laughs> big surprise turn i don't think that i'll ever find myself in that situation but it's a compelling story for sure and it's a, a really cool and exciting movie And then the next film that we're going to be opening up is another sports-related film. It is Brian Banks, directed by Tom Shadiak. And it is uh, about a football player's dreams to play in the NFL that are halted when he is wrongly convicted and sent to prison. Years later, he fights to clear his name within an unjust system. When I was young, it was hard to see a way out. Football gave me an option. By the time I was 16, I had the attention of the NFL. The sky is the limit for this kid. So what happened? Why don't you play anymore? Brian Banks was 16 years old when he was accused of a crime he did not commit. He lost 11 years. Scholarship. He was prevented from playing football. 
The system is broken. We have 10 months to clear his name. If in that time they do not overturn your conviction, you'll be a prisoner again. And the thing that I find most interesting about this is sort of like the second half of the career of Tom Shadow. Yeah. I'm not saying like his almost the end of his career, but I mean, this is the man that directed Ace Ventura and like a lot of like Jim Carrey and Steve Carell, big studio right. comedies. And then a few years back, he took a radical shift and had this documentary that we played called I Am. And ever since then, he's been sort of more introspective in his, in his yeah, film yeah. choices certainly and maybe it's the kind of thing where he's like all right well i've made enough money now i don't need to worry about you know taking all the cash from the studios for the big big studio films and he's doing more personal kind of projects and bryant banks certainly seems to fit it really in. does because that's um i so like when i first saw the title and read the description i just assumed it was another documentary that we were gonna, that we were gonna be showing because it uh -huh. sounds like a documentary right. uh but it's not yeah. it's a yeah, you know dramatic narrative but it has that uh, the elements of kind of like standing up for the underdog or for the accused and the unjust, but then also the, the mm -hmm. system is corrupt itself. It, yeah, it does not line up with the liar liars and Ace Ventura's of his previous <laughs> career. And it's, it is always fascinating when a filmmaker has what, from the public's perspective, having never met the guy, what looks like a clear right. break in what his production interests are. Cause even his, um, he's been an active producer for the last few years as well, doing very thoughtful, mm -hmm. like you said, introspective, contemplative documentaries about weighty social issues that he clearly, uh, you right. know, wants to be part of bringing those uh, discussions to the forefront. Yeah. So, I mean, the man that brought us Patch Adams is now like, you know, it's just that yeah, yeah. kind of boggles my mind. I've never seen Patch Adams and I don't know that there's enough money in the world to make me watch <laughs> Patch Adams, but uh, I, I really, I thought I Am was a very interesting yeah. film. Uh, I'm not really that spiritual or kind of, you know, um, new agey, right. but uh, I, I thought it was an interesting movie. And uh, I, have, I haven't seen Brian Banks yet, but uh, it, it is getting uh, pretty good reviews. And I'm curious to see how it does here at the Cedar Lee. The uh, third film we're opening is Them That Follow from director Britt Poulton and Dan Madison Savage. Uh, I should probably note, not that Dan Savage. Different Dan yeah, Savage. Not, not, he's going, yeah, he's using the middle Dan name Savage. for a reason. <laughs> uh, Them That Follow is uh, set in the wilds of Appalachia where believers handle death-dealing snakes to prove themselves before God. So it tells the story specifically of a pastor's daughter who holds the secret that threatens to tear her community apart. Who you choose, girl, chooses your whole life. My daughter has turned into a fine girl, and a good man has asked for her hand. He never laid eyes on something so pure. We're never gonna make any sense. What's rustling, you go? Yeah, the only thing that makes any sense in this place. When the devil creeps in, you need someone to see the truth even when you don't. So this one is, uh, you know, kind of early in the career for both directors. But uh, I was pointing out the first thing that caught my eye in the cast was Walton Goggins, uh, who's a great mm -hmm. character actor who anytime he can get more of like a lead performance and a, you know, kind of cult set in the uh, the wilds of Appalachia sounds <laughs> great for him. It, like he just seems like yeah, it's perfect it sounds, for him. That's in Walton Goggins. Really it really, awesome, really is. Sure. But then you pointed out... Uh, yeah, that the film also features this year's Best Actress Oscar winner, uh, Olivia Coleman, who I love, love, love. Of course, she is, uh, you know, this, I don't know that you would think immediately Olivia Coleman, Appalachia, you know, like snake handling. Not uh, at first, but after her work in... Uh... The, the favorite. favorite. I almost said the farewell, not mm -hmm. the farewell. Her work in the favorite. I was like, I don't. She can do whatever she wants. I'll, I'll watch. Yeah, she can. <laughs> I love Olivia Coleman. I mean, but I and again in my mind, I first knew her like a lot of people as a comedian, but then she gave one of the most heart wrenching performances of all time yeah. in uh, Tyrannosaur. And this this is. Uh, you know, uh, another dramatic turn for her. And it also, speaking of like, me, this also has Jim Gaffigan in it. Um, oh, really? So, uh, uh, I, I, I yeah, apparently I, didn't keep scrolling in the cast list. <laughs> yeah. I So again, I don't know. I haven't seen the film yet. So I, I don't know, like, if, if is Jim Gaffigan being dramatic or is he kind of in there as a sort of, you know, maybe he's a, a comedic element in the film. I'm not sure. But uh, I, if, it, if he isn't, then it would fit into uh, last year's or last week's theme of comedians Very true. going dramatic. Very true. So. Mm -hmm. uh, and speaking of our Cedarly 3 list, we'll be right back with our Cedarly 3 picks for this week.
So each week we like to take inspiration from one of the new films and suggest three films to broaden your cinematic world. So this week we took inspiration from Maiden, a documentary about, like we just mentioned, uh, Tracy Edwards leading the first all-male crew in the wit bread round the world race. Because mm-hmm. uh, it, I guess it would, at first I was thinking it's kind of an, a non-traditional sports documentary, but like it's a sport, it's a grueling endeavor. It's like you said, with sure. a very easy comparison to Free Solo from last year, mm-hmm. uh, something that most people are never going to do. Um, but also documenting like the physical feat that it takes, uh, the physical strength it takes to accomplish such a feat. Right. Um, I didn't quite stick with that specific theme like Maiden has with mine, uh, but I did notice sort of a, an evolving theme uh, in that I'm not a huge sports nut, but the sports documentaries <laughs> no. that hit me kind of hit me for very specific reasons. Uh, how did your, your list kind of thematically? Well, we're the same. I mean, like people... I'm not the biggest sports fan. I mean, I love going to baseball games and I and I do watch sports, but I I always joke with people that I watch everything, like movie right, wise, right. like I watch everything. But I sh- need to stop saying that because apparently I say like I watch everything except for a lot of sports documentaries. Right. <laughs> because as I was looking through trying to compile this list, I was like, boy, I really haven't seen a lot of bigger title kind of right, right. ones of of this kind of field. So. Um, some of my choices are a little bit outside the box, I think, but I, they are uh, at least two. Of them. There are things that we played here at the Cedar Lee or at the. When you say outside so the box, they, you're talking yeah. like a documentary, and like a bocce ball tournament, and that counts as a sport, well, or like. Um, I, I'll oh, just start okay. the yeah. first one on my list: uh, "The King of Kong: A Fistful of Quarters." Oh. Uh, 2007, Seth Gordon, because video games are sports yeah. now. Yeah, esports I mean, is huge are, right now. Ooh, yeah. huge so i figured this one counts. it's a comp- competition not, there's yeah yeah yeah. Is, yeah and it is one of the most wildly entertaining documentaries you will ever watch because if you've not seen it if you're not aware of what it is it's, it is about um someone trying to break the world's record of you know the highest score of donkey kong and the competitive this is of classic arcade video games kind of like the classic iconic 80s video oh, yeah. games these guys that have dedicated their lives to this and um, the rivalry between these two guys. And it is it is just peppered with the most entertaining, colorful characters that are just hilarious. And, it, and it's a really very entertaining, well-constructed documentary. And we did play it here for a few weeks, uh, you know, over... 10 years ago here at the Cedar Lee, but it's a great, great movie. And I've actually been wanting to rewatch it. So this has made me realize like, yeah, I've been, uh, I feel like a few days or a few weeks ago, I came across it like on a streaming thing and I almost watched it and I didn't. So this week I'm going to actually do it. And what's the first one on your list that's outside the box? Um, Well, I, mine really aren't, outside the box like that i mean there's still i'm, oh. I'm gonna go with i'm gonna say i'm gonna give you a little judge here i'm gonna say mine all uh are around like legitimate generally oh, recognized I sports see. all right <laughs> well my other two okay, are, okay. no no so i think that one other, yeah. that one works though because it's also that documentary kind of subgenre of they found right. this the just a crazy cast of real life characters that play oh, each other yeah. so well you're uh-huh. like if they made a fictional version of that documentary i wouldn't believe it because you're like, yeah. you're just amping up the shenanigans to be like, I mean, it's like Adam mm-hmm. Sandler level characters, right. but they're real people. It's it's really kind of nuts. And and you say that, actually, that reminds me, I feel like there was- There was talk about when that. When that film came out, yeah. yeah, there was some, they were adapting it to a, a, a narrative feature and that just never happened. Maybe they realized what was going on there, but- yeah. uh, so my, you, you can't beat reality sometimes. My uh, first one, uh, first one I thought of was Murderball. From 2005. Oh, yeah. I mm-hmm. believe it played at the film festival downtown. It did, um, yeah. And then it absolutely the theater did. for mm-hmm. a bit. Uh, so this mm-hmm. was, I would say this is in the genre of like it's uh, an overlooked world of sports where this is um, a bunch of Olympians. They're, they're getting ready for the Paralympics mm-hmm. in rugby wheelchair, which is known as murder ball, mm-hmm. for good reason. I... I probably like tensed up more watching this movie than I do with like most horror films or thrillers. Cause like the sound yeah. of the chairs, like crashing together seeing uh-huh. like, I mean the sound of just bones crashing together. Like they are yeah. ruthless rugby players, uh, happen to also be in wheelchairs. And again, it's a cast of characters. These are like that, that competitive mentality that I do not have that really great athletes have that are just like, right. I, I train for this. This is my life. This is what I'm doing. Period. Mm-hmm. Going to be the best. And it's, it's a, it's an astonishing documentary. It's not quite like Pennebaker fly on the wall style. It's kind of, you know, interviews and goes behind mm-hmm. the scenes as they train for, I think it was the Greece Olympics back in, when, you know, 2006, whatever it was. This film was from 2005, but uh, most libraries around Northeast Ohio uh, carry murder books. It was, it was quite a documentary hit, so mm-hmm. I would uh, definitely check that one out if yeah. you haven't seen it yet. And it was nominated for Best Documentary, I believe, at the Academy Awards that year. Yeah, it was. 
And uh, it was almost on my list, but then I, I went with other ones. But then you went with so, other non-sport uh, <laughs> documentaries. <laughs> <laughs> then, well, keeping in the uh, peripheral, uh, you know, periphery of sports uh, docs, uh, we showed this film, again, over 10 years ago, I think, here at the Cedar okay. Lee, uh, full of more colorful characters. Uh, it's called A League of Ordinary Gentlemen, which was all about professional bowlers yeah. and these guys trying to get televised bowling you know, back in, in fashion or whatever. It is just an incredibly, again, it's the characters in this. It almost felt like Kingpin come to life, if you saw <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it really the Fairly Brothers movie. <laughs> There's, it, it, yeah, it's just insane. The one guy has a signature move every time he gets a strike. That's all I'll say. And it is. it became sort of like a thing that we were all doing around the office, uh, me and uh, the director of operations at the time. That was kind of our go-to little joke move at, uh, whenever we did anything that we thought was good, uh, just like this guy had his little victory <laughs> strike move. So it is, it's just a really fun, uh, entertaining documentary by Christopher Brown. So I'd encourage you to check that one out as well. Again, we're finding like the right sports have certain maybe mindset or kind of like uh, the the oddball characters that are real people. But right. like you, you want that in your documentary because you can have a doc on even just like a specific subculture, um, let mm-hmm. alone like if the sport itself is interesting. Mine, uh, my next one is Red Army from 2014. Um, again, like I probably seen maybe two hockey games in my life, but this one is this is more like that same thing that links that people and in this case the country will go to mm-hmm. to win. So this is about um, kind of how post World War II uh, Russia put a lot of money and funding and priority on uh, well rebuilding for one, but also like reasserting themselves on a on a world stage. And one of the ways would be the Olympics uh, with uh, hockey in this case, but also just exporting. It's kind of like there's even a scene in this movie where you get to the '80s and there's like the red not the red scare portion, but like that Cold War mentality of the '80s. Right. And you go to Detroit, Michigan, and you have like four or five Russian players all coming to the Detroit shoot hockey team whose name I'm totally blanking on right now. Red Wings. Um, uh, yes, yes we'll it's say it's that Wings. one. Such sports fans we are. <laughs> well, no, I love hockey, so uh, I'm I'm from Pittsburgh. Remember? Oh, that's so true. I've yeah, seen yeah. Many, many, many Penguins many hockey games. games. Yeah, mm-hmm. but it, it's like in the middle of they have these clips of like you know Reagan and all the scare tactics going on in the Cold War, and there's all these just like great working class sports fan interviews in Detroit where they're just like, "We love Russia," you know, because like they're winning for like their local hockey team that they're a fan of. So like it's really interesting the way yeah. it kind of mixed with like uh, politics and sports culture kind of overlap there, but. Some of the mm-hmm. training they talk about and the recruiting in Russia, you're just like it. It is uh, again, it's an intensity that I'm never going to experience because it's just not in my wheelhouse. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's just not. Uh, yeah, you're not going to uh, uh, find yourself out there no. on the on the ice. No, no. Well, the the last one on my list is about a real sport, quote unquote, <laughs> real sport. Uh, <laughs> And specifically a pitcher. It's the um, film uh, No No, a documentary uh, about Doc Ellis. So documentary is spelled D-O-C-K. Right, right. Uh, and uh, it's a great doc from just a few it years is. ago. We showed it again as part of the Fall Doc series, I believe, um, uh, four or five years ago. And it is uh, about Doc Ellis, who was a pitcher for the Pittsburgh Pirates at the time and uh, famously pitched a no-hitter while tripping on LSD. So it is is just a really interesting, fun, but sort of sad documentary as well as this man was obviously fighting some demons. Yeah. And it is, uh, but it's it's a really great movie. If you, Even if you don't like baseball, that's that's when you know like you're watching a good uh, sports right. documentary or any documentary when you're not really that interested in the in the topic or subject as a right. whole, but the film still grabs you and it's an engrossing film. And this certainly is. I hate baseball. It's like almost one of my least favorite sports, but my dad was a big Pirates fan because he grew up near Pittsburgh. Uh-huh. And when that movie was playing, I was like, oh, hey, there's this uh, documentary about this guy, Doc Ellis. And he was like, the LSD guy? And then he just told me that that part. And I was like, I'm in. What? Yeah. What happened? <laughs> yeah. And it was. It was a great documentary that I even by mm-hmm. the end, though, like he ends up becoming an advocate for uh, sobriety and, you know, at right. risk people and getting people, um, you know, off whatever their addictions are. So it is mm-hmm. I feel like it's pretty triumphant by the end. But it went in, in directions yeah. that I, I had no idea coming. I went for the thrill of just like he did what? And, you know, it yeah. was a lot more than that. And it was it was really, really engaging. And uh, yeah, it was it was number four on my list. I just didn't uh, get that one in. Actually. It would have made it in, but my number one, I went with uh, Hoop Dreams just because it seems like, you know, kind of the mm-hmm. sports documentary, but it's also from 94. So I feel like maybe people need a little reminder like that movie is out there and that it's that astonishing. Movie yeah. And mm-hmm. it's uh, Steve James, definitely his best film, but it also 
kind of I was thinking about the direct cinema and D.A. Pennebaker and Steve James kind of has that, I think, uh, aesthetic Absolutely. in his yeah. movies. So that one jumped up right to my uh, my number one for this week. Just, you know, a little nostalgia, but also thinking about, you know, he's Steve James is one of those filmmakers, too. He embeds himself with whatever he's covering. And so he was and, and his crew were um, filming William Gates and Arthur Agee for like five plus years um, mm-hmm. uh, following their hoop dreams going from, you know, high school uh, all the way through. And their dreams of trying to, you know, play uh, uh, NBA right. basketball. Um, and it's, you know, all the ups and downs that are going to happen in uh, kids' lives over like a five, six year period are there. Uh, but also that, again, like that sports mentality where they're very driven. They want this one thing mm-hmm. and they're going to do whatever they can to uh, to get themselves there. And, and they see it as their only way out of their life. Right. You know, they, that's that they're they are literally putting all of their hopes and dreams on this one, one thing. thing. Yeah. And uh, and that's right. It. And that movie famously was absolutely one of the best reviewed, like on most critics, like top 10 lists, if not their number one movie. Of the oh, year absolutely. That yeah. Year. And then famously did not get a best documentary uh, nomination. Right. It was nominated for uh, editing. At the Oscars. Yeah. And it, it was like this outrage about like, what is wrong with the documentary yeah. uh, wing of the Academy that they would not nominate this film and uh, what kind of probable racism there was you know when you talk about the fact that uh you know they're dealing with it still at the academy that there's just there are way too many old white guys uh in, in charge of a lot of these things right and uh that's probably what happened there and why why that film was not recognized like it should have been at the Oscars. but then getting like the best editing nomination because like there was obviously years of footage to edit down and it is a huge task yeah. but like almost just ignore it entirely right. then don't give it like the nomination for editing <laughs> and then just totally ignore it in its own category well, but no i mean it's great that they got nominated no no it is it is but so yeah but it's one of those like if you're gonna ignore a movie just it, totally it, ignore it don't do it you know that way well but i think that showed that made the omission from the documentary that's true even more yeah, yeah, it really was because it uh, clearly was on the radar yeah. of members of the academy and the fact that this one because documentaries get nominated by a committee and all this right stuff, right and rounds of, of voting you know, and, like yeah. a broader kind of thing yeah so it, it clearly just showed that uh yeah that they were not uh probably uh, uh, we'll just call them racist yeah that's fine but, you know i think that's probably what it was i want to say if you <laughs> as also just as our last little note on hoop dreams if you want to read some either like one just an amazing example of film criticism uh read roger ebert's initial review for hoop dreams but then mm-hmm. also if you want to read some oh. great film think pieces read some of the stuff he wrote about it being excluded at the end of the year as well i yeah i was gonna say i vividly remember his rant on uh, you know or on the uh, show the movies yeah, yeah yeah on the show he went off yes. i mean like because like he was the big champion of that film he certainly was and you know yeah i i can still like i i remember his rant more than i remember the movie to be honest with you so like, <laughs> if that shows the impression that it made i mean i remember right the right too but obviously you know it was just it was an amazing uh a moment it's a weird moment in it really movie, is so and at the yeah. same time then uh just to tie it all back uh steve james ended up doing the life itself documentary about roger ebert uh towards the you yeah. know towards, towards the end of right. his uh, his life there well on next week's episode we will be discussing blinded by the light and where'd you go bernadette so our suitably three picks are going to be inspired by Blinded by the Light, uh, which is the story of Javid, who is inspired by the music of Bruce Springsteen to follow his dreams uh, in the plot of that film. So our topic is going to be icons that inspire. Submit any of your picks at Cedarly Theater using the hashtag Cedarly3, the number three. So before we sign off for this week, we do want to let you know about a few special events we do have coming up. The first film, we have uh, some additional shows of Bring the Soul. This is the new BTS documentary and concert film that's going to be playing August 9th and August 10th at 1.30 and then August 11th at 4.30. And the Melt Barn Grilled Late Shift film series continues with our monthly showing of Tommy Wiseau's masterpiece, uh, The Room. Yeah, we'll call it a masterpiece. (laughs) I just like saying it with a question mark. Uh, It could be a masterpiece of crap. (laughs) His masterpiece of crap, The Room, is showing Saturday, August 10th at 10 p.m. And then uh, Fathom Events is part of the TCM Classics on the big screen. We're showing Hello, Dolly! for its 50th anniversary. This, of course, is the classic musical starring Barbara Streisand, Walter Matthau, Michael Crawford, directed by Gene Kelly. I mean, you can't get more... I mean, Walter Matthau is not known as a musical icon, but certainly Gene Kelly, Barbara Streisand, and Michael oh, Crawford yeah. are. <laughs> uh, which is going to be playing Sunday, August 11th at 1 o'clock and Wednesday, August 14th at 7 o'clock. And if you've never seen Hello, Dolly! on the big screen, it really is a big screen yeah. kind of spectacle movie with the widescreen, gorgeous costumes, amazing sets, great songs. It's just a lot of fun on the big screen. Uh, Fathom Events also presents Millennium Actress, the new restoration of what many believe to be uh, Set 
Satoshi Khan's greatest work. This was the director of Perfect Blue and Paprika. Uh, Millennium Actress will be showing Tuesday, August 13th at 7 p.m. And then finally, we have another 50th anniversary. We're going to be showing with Fathom Events, Woodstock, the director's cut. So this is the full, like, almost four-hour-long version of Woodstock. And that is playing uh, Thursday, August 15th at 7 o'clock. I can't believe that's such a great parallel with Hello, Dolly, where you're like the know, like the but... counterculture making its emergence in 70s cinema, like well... the exact same year as Hello, Dolly is out, that they're both 50 years is uh, pretty wild. And sadly, one last special event for this week, the passing of Toni Morrison uh, reminded us we had just shown the documentary Toni Morrison, The Pieces I Am from director Timothy Greenfeld Sanders. Uh, it was a hit at, uh, this past spring at the Cleveland Film Festival and it was a hit when it played at the Cedar Lee. And we'll be bringing it back to honor her memory for a limited run uh, this week at the theater. As always, thank you for tuning in to Cedar Lee Radio and lending us your ears this week. All the music heard on the show is original music written by Grant Heinemann and performed by the New Heights Jazz Ensemble, used with their permission, of course. Visit clevelandcinemas.com for correct showtimes and to purchase advanced tickets. Also, there are links in the show notes. You can use those if you'd like as well. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are at Cedar Lee Theater, spelled with an R-E at the end because we're fancy like that. Don't forget to subscribe to the show wherever you find your podcast. And while you're subscribing, leave us a rating and review or better yet, tell a fellow film geek about the show. We'll see you at the movies.